Kiko trembles in a closet as footsteps outside shake the ground. A portal made of chalk opens up behind him and he timidly makes his escape. He finds himself in the sprawling Brazilian favela in which he lives, where magic chalk now transforms the slum into a playground. His companions are the apprehensive girl Alejandra and the giant lumbering pinkish thing called Monster. Monster is generally ambivalent about Kiko, but is still helpful to reach high ledges. Video games and pop culture have always had a tension-filled relationship. Socially, video games kind of oscillate between a geeky hobby and the marker of a socially atypical outcast. At best, simple entertainment, and at worst, a public hazard. And modern discourse around video games is so wrapped up in ideas of identity politics, culture war, not to mention over 25 years of disagreeing psychological studies on whether or not video games are harmful or not, that the very notion of video games as an art form has completely fallen by the wayside. And when the occasional art critic or columnist decides to weigh in on the matter, more often than not, video games are denoted as a valiant technical feat, but inevitably too tied up with pop culture to be considered a valid art form. Well, I think video games are art. And not just that, but an incredibly powerful form of art in the unique opportunities presented by the medium that immerse its audience in its narratives. Opportunities that I'm very excited to share with you, but first, we must address why this talk needs to exist in the first place. Criticism against video games is very widespread and typically takes one of three forms. One, that video games are socially harmful. Two, that video games are fundamentally a product. And three, that video games are fundamentally a toy. The first argument that video games are socially harmful is a difficult topic to broach. Like I said earlier, there are a vast amount of reputable studies going back and forth on whether or not video games cause violence or exacerbate antisocial behavior, or if they actually promote problem solving and deep thinking. These studies often contradict and call each other out, and questionable research practices are sadly common. So I strongly suggest that you do your own research and come to your own conclusions. However, I must stress that potential for harm has never disqualified any medium from being a valid art form, and that must hold true for video games. This ties into the second argument, that video games are fundamentally a product. This is generally true, because yes, more often than not, video games are products. Simply by the rules of the world that we live in, art must sell in order to self-propagate. It is a huge reason why violence and hypersexualization are, hypersexualization are so common, not just in many mainstream games, but pop culture at large. It sells. You're going to see a lot more Marvel movies than Hitchcock's. The third point, that video games are fundamentally a toy, it's a little more complex. Critics often say that video games being interactive strips them of some fundamental criterion that keeps them from being a valid art form. That ideas of objectives, win or fail states, or player control over a narrative makes it no longer an expression of an artist, but instead a simple toy. To quote acclaimed film critic Roger Ebert, video games, by their nature, require player choices, which is the opposite of the strategy of serious film and literature, which requires authorial control. Papo and Yo continues as a fairly standard puzzle game. You, as Kiko, traverse the landscape of the favela, solving many puzzles, uh, using the magic chalk to push around buildings, pushing around monster on a moving platform, tossing around frogs. But when monster sees one of these frogs, he awakens from his ambivalent stupor, chases it down, and eats it. This sends him into a blinding rage, snarling and flaming, violently throwing, away, th throwing around anything that comes near him. After several bouts of frog-induced fury, Monster manages to catch and eat Alejandra. But not before she tells Kiko of a shaman on the mountaintop, which may cure Monster of his anger. So, using frogs to lure Monster onward, Kiko and Monster head to the mountaintop. During this journey, there are brief moments where Kiko awakens in a dream and experiences a past memory. That of his father accidentally hitting someone with his car in a dark rainstorm. Illuminated by the headlights, his shadow takes a familiar form. I and several others hold the opposite opinion to Ebert. Interactivity is, without a doubt, video games' biggest strength as a medium and should, in fact, serve as proof of its validity as an art form. If the purpose of art is to be the method of translation between the perspective of the artist and the perspective of the audience, then allowing the audience to interact with the art in ways carefully designed by the artist is not removing authorial control, it is enhancing it. From the perspective of a game designer, allowing for player input does not diminish the amount of control you have over interpretation of your work, it actually allows for some incredibly fine-tuned nuances. In the same way that a painter will use composition to carefully guide their viewer's eye through a painting to further drive home their artistic intent, 
Game designers will have their game carefully guide and react to players to further drive home the point of the game. And this takes place in many forms. Uh, some fairly common examples include letting a player physically explore a fictional world to allow them to further immerse themselves in the narrative, or letting the player have full conversations with non-player characters uh, to have deeper empathy with both the characters that they're talking to, but also the character that they're playing as. Other games go a little deeper. By having the game at large react to players' ethical decisions, game designers can interrogate players' morals and challenge their beliefs. Alternatively, some game designers will present players with intentionally limited choices to force them to alter their perspectives and to disrupt normal patterns of problem solving. But this is all getting a little theoretical, so let's break down a concrete example. Upon reaching the mountaintop, Kiko finds a solitary flame surrounded by statues of monster chasing him and eating frogs. The flame, who can talk, tells Kiko that there is no shaman, only him and his forgotten memories. The statues transform into their true meaning. Depictions of monster becomes depictions of Kiko's father. The frogs become bottles of alcohol. The flame tells us what we have been dreading, that there is no cure for monster. All that is left is to let him go. Suddenly, we see the story that was presented to us earlier in a completely new light. Kiko's magic chalk, a symbol of his imagination and creativity, served as a vehicle for escaping his trauma, but also transformed a harsh landscape into a friendly one. Also, the perception of Kiko's father as a literal monster, and even the perception of the bottles of alcohol as much less threatening frogs, and the use of those frogs to manipulate monsters' actions, were all Kiko's coping mechanisms to deal with an abusive father who fell into alcoholism after a fatal car crash. Coping mechanisms that we, as the, as the players, have adopted. We, like Kiko has, learned the million ways of dodging around monster to avoid the blow of his hand. We, like Kiko, have learned to solve our problems with creativity and imagination for better or for worse. I mean, we're practically told from the beginning of the game what it's gonna be about. The title literally means father and me, yet we, like Kiko, choose to distract ourselves with puzzles and games and metaphors. The gameplay is as crucial a storytelling element as the writing or the visual design in that it places us in the, in the, in the shoes of the protagonist on a level that could only be accomplished in this medium. And now, with Kiko, we must let Monster go. Using frogs, bottles of alcohol now, we lure Monster to the edge of a cliff and we let him go, ending the game on a metaphorical and literal level. When I hear someone say that video games aren't art, more often than not, that sentiment seems to come from a lack of experience over anything else. I mean, it makes sense. If your only interactions with games are as a passive onlooker, then you'd have no reason to see video games as art. But it's impossible to deny, in good faith, that video games are art, and the world is full of them. Find a story to dive into, a world to explore, a metaphor to unwind. And if you can't, or if you simply don't want to, I urge you to staunchly support those that do. Video games are, in many ways, still in their infancy, and the power of your mere respect for the medium, even without interacting with it directly, is immeasurable. But for what it's worth, I think you should give video games a shot. Browse some indie games, most are fairly inexpensive, and if one catches your eye and touches your heart in the way so many games have touched mine, then you too will see for yourself why video games are art. Thank you.